Hey everyone. How's everyone doing? All right, come on. How's everyone doing? Oh, excellent, excellent. I just want that energy match. Um, this photo, I can't remember who to attribute it to. Uh, it's a photo of Richmond, Virginia. I worked there for three years. Uh, I still live in Virginia. Um, and I just want to, my wife told me not to do this, uh, but I just want to caution parts of this talk gets a little heavy. So um, I'm going to start with a quick story that's going to tie into AI bias. Uh, from 18 years ago, 2004, uh, I'm done with work. I am, um, water. Uh, I'm done with work. I grab my gym bag, change up, put my stuff in my uh, change of clothes, start walking the maybe quarter mile from my office to the gym. Uh, on the way there, patrol officers block my path as I was crossing the street. The time it took for me to take my uh, headphones or earbuds out, I don't remember. I was on the floor. You know, we know how that story goes, right? Um, Long story short, it was a case of mistaken identity, right? I was wearing sweats and a white tee. And in 2004, they just described half of Richmond because that's what everybody was wearing. Um, I was traumatized. I frankly still am because we all heard the stories. Our parents talked to us about how to act when you're pulled over, or what, what, to, what not to say and that kind of stuff. Uh, th thankfully, nothing bad happened. Uh, so who am I? I'm noble, uh, the one in the middle, if it's not too obvious. <laughs> and uh, I'm fortunate uh, to call myself a father to these two wonderful girls here. For work, I lend my time preaching the gospel of, uh, you know, fairness, bias, data stewardship for emergent tech. Um, I was here in 2019 doing a similar talk on augmented reality. Um, and um, I do that, I do the emergent tech stuff, you know, gratis for a nonprofit organization called CyberXR. Um, and we sort of bridge uh, legislators and companies like Meta so that they don't repeat the same mistakes uh, that they've made with dark patterns in. I don't want to ever say the metaverse word, but I just did. So uh, in, in augmented reality, virtual reality, what we call extended reality. Uh, full time, though, because that doesn't pay the bills. Uh, full time, though, I'm a product executive uh, in Northern Virginia, a little company called Ventera. Uh, you may not have heard of it. Uh, there, I work on responsible AI, uh, responsible delivery of AI, responsible maintenance and management of AI. and and advocate the responsible use of a lot of the tooling uh, that goes into getting uh, applied and practical machine learning out into, into production. Um, so the work that I do um, is actually motivated by these two girls because I want them to live in a world that is equitable and fair with all the tools that they're using. And I should say again that um, uh, I'm here to talk about the pillar, you know, two of the five pillars, in my view, uh, of responsible AI. Uh, and these are the five pillars. Um, one is um, I lead teams day in and day out to leverage human-centered machine learning approaches. So just the interfaces, how humans interface with machine learning. So, you know, giving context to why, um, you know, the, uh, the recommendation or the prediction happened uh, to an end user or stakeholder. And I'll get to the stakeholders here in a second. Uh, so that's HTML. I also help teams define fairness for their machine learning. Often I get approached by you know, a large three letter agency or a large logo that you might be familiar with and they come to me and say, hey, we have a lot of data. Uh, can you AI the thing? And then I. I become the dream killer and say, that's not how it works. Uh, and then we sort of work our way backwards from what problem are you looking to solve, right? Uh, next, um, you know, you get the uh, product, you know, you're training your model, you're trying to get the model into production. Uh, there's this concept called interpretable AI models. Uh, 
or explainability. That's XAI. That's uh, another acronym that you're going to take with you. Uh, but we'll get into that today. Uh, next, um, I'm, yeah, data privacy, being good stewards of, of user data is core. Um, you know, in the context of AI, I find myself using a lot of synthetic data or advocating for the use of uh, synthetic data using tools like Gretel. I don't know that anyone's heard of Gretel uh, AI uh, for you know, preventing, um, you know, pulling in uh, person, protected health information or personally identifiable or sensitive information uh, just to get and test or train data, whether structured or unstructured data. And then finally, uh, there's the security aspect. There's the building robust models where, by that I'm saying, you know, adding a little bit of noise to um, your, your, your data doesn't really change the way it behaves. So today you get a twofer, lots packed in this talk. Hopefully I can weave a narrative uh, that takes, you know, helps you take away the complexity of, of this, um, uh, this field. So the next time, love them or hate them, the next time some of these big tech companies screw up royally, you know that you know, there are humans behind there and they probably come to work every day uh, to try to you know, make everyone's lives better. But at scale, uh, fairness and bias is not easy. It's very hard. I do have some tricks uh, of the trade, though. So that is the, those are the five pillars, and you, you're, you're, you're lucky to have two of them. Whenever you see this little animation, um, I have a question for you. Um, what was your time to AI this morning? I mean, let me ask it a different way. So how long did it take you from being dead asleep to interacting with an AI. <laughs> Alarm, was it an AI? Okay, great. There you go. So if AI is to be ambient, right, as in like it just fades away in the background and serves us, uh, it should be fair. Do we agree? Uh, if it takes a few seconds, like some of you have to think about it, right? It takes a figure to figure out which features on your phone are powered by AI or the devices or the fridge that you're, you opened or the Uber you took or the whatever it is, then perhaps the value it delivered behaved fairly to you. One can make that assumption. Um, that said, throughout the day, you may also have a lot of interactions that, I'm sorry. So, I'm talking about artificial intelligence in the deep learning context. So we're talking about complex models sometimes or a, an ensemble or combination of different less complex models that are very hard to understand what's happening. It's often called like a black box. Uh, but I should have probably defined artificial intelligence, uh, which is basically the notion that uh, you can teach a machine uh, to either automate repetitive tasks or augment things for humans by which we're deriving from data, right? So humans, um, when, when I trip and fall, I make mistakes, right? And I learn from that. I know not to touch that hot pot. Um, in the context of AI, that would be uh, data, right? Um, it would learn from lagging insights or historical data in order to make a classification, a recommendation, or a prediction. You are welcome. Great question. So, um, so throughout the day, you may have you, you you might have wondered. Oh wait, there's I booked um, an Uber from this hotel and. Uh, I was charged 5% higher than someone else who booked. I'm just using a simple made-up example. But there might be some things that make you want to question um, why something might be fair uh, with an AI as a consumer. Um, so that's sort of, sort of baseline fair, uh, fairness in a way. In the United States, there are two doctrines. Um, I won't get into it too much. 
But one is disparate treatment of people, uh, meaning you want to um, you want to improve procedure procedural fairness. The other is disparate impact. Um, the goal of which is more distributive justice, minimizes minimizing like differences in outcomes. So, you know, if a group of us you know, booked a fare and we were charged one thing. I don't know why I'm using Uber as this example. I'm just riffing here. But, um, and, you know, because of my social economic class or the location that I used and another group got charged, you know, 20% higher or lower, that is actually legal doctrine. You could actually get sued in the United States. Fairness is hard because how do you actually mathematically quantify fairness? It's tough to do because there's no single definition of fairness. Fairness evolves over ages. What was fair 20 years ago is not fair today. It could, uh, couldn't be fair today sometimes. Um, also, fairness is context dependent, right? Um, you know, in the medical sense, um, you know, as a black person, there's some ailments that um, affect me worse than an Asian person or um, a European person. Uh, and so how a doctor might choose to treat it, painting a broad brush and say, we should all be treated equal, and that's fair, is sort of a misnomer. We do want, however, our AIs to act fairly as much as possible. And today I'll be talking a bit, a bit of the hot topics like the social technical um, issues around fairness. Uh, and I'll cover some of the baseline fairness metrics uh, that folks smarter than I have sort of put together as a baseline so that you can actually have some of these defined fairness in your context for your enterprise application, um, uh, if, you will, if you will. Uh, so that you're not, you, you can help decrease, I'm a product manager by training, uh, so, you know, Bias, right, is noise, right? And if you're introducing noise into your data, um, you're gonna get disproportionate product failure, right? That's, no one's gonna adopt your app if it does not act consistently, right? Um, so from a business standpoint, it just makes sense. Uh, however, um, bias leads to harm, uh, and I'll go through that today too. It can lead to harm, uh, and so, you know, there's um, a lady in, uh, called Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee. She, she's at uh, Brookings Institute. Uh, and I was on a panel with her a few weeks ago. And she used the term tra traumatized data. And she defined that as um, uh, uh, um, trauma from collective psychological and emotional cognitive distress experienced by an unprivileged class. In my case with that Richmond story, African Americans. I'm British by birth, African, African by heritage, uh, but I'm in that class. And that class is a protected class. So there are a few popular metrics. Uh, this is a screenshot from one of many um, frameworks or packages that you can download you know, statistical parity, equal opportunity difference. I'm not gonna go through each one, each one of these. However, I'll do you one solid for a few seconds. You can scan this. This is by IBM Research. One of three or four um, uh, fairness packages and frameworks that I actually adopted. And I will bring this back uh, at, during Q&A in case you didn't, if you're interested and you, you wanna see it again. All right, so do we feel here that humans are perfect? That's a leading question, right? But so we're not perfect, and since we're not perfect, we encode, better yet, propagate our biases into the data that we use to train AI. That's not a controversial, that's just fact, it's human. Uh, I'll give one example uh, from a tra traumatized data with my example uh, in Richmond, Virginia. Police departments use algorithms to, today to help them figure out where to send resources. However, machine learning algorithms today are correlative, not causal. 
the algorithm that is the algorithm, algorithm cannot understand if an arrest was fair, unfair, or unjust. It just sees an arrest. And the algorithm is going to send police where it thinks the crime is. But on its own, it won't understand that traditionally, this is where police have sent resources, for example, where I live, where people may look like me. Therefore, that's where the AI has seen most of the crime. Therefore, that's where the police sees the crime. In some cases, egregiously unfairly. It's an apology from Starbucks when two brothers were just sitting at a Starbucks. You all remember that story, right? Therefore, that's where they've made the arrests. Therefore, more resources are sent there. Therefore, the data that we have access to is traumatized, and the output of machine learning algorithms leads to perhaps more stereotypes, more prejudice, assumptions leading to new harms amongst groups or individuals. It's a, like this endless flywheel that is accelerated by AI. Seriously, I presented this at work just to a couple of my colleagues, and they said, you are doing too much in this intro uh, it's too political. And I said, there are cops out there thinking they're precog from Minority Report. Like, this is happening, right? It's pretty scary. And some of the foundational, you've heard about Transformers, GPT-3, there's some foundational uh, models out there that encode some of this stuff already that we're going to be building on top of. I'll get into that. Let's get back to bias. Um, by the way, pay attention to this slide. I'm going to keep coming back to it, and there's going to be a quiz, or a couple. From a statistical bias standpoint, statisticians say bias starts from the data. Um, the algorithm, so I took that, and I said, the algorithms transmit it, right? And then users interact with it. Um, and users are often susceptible to harm because the outcomes don't reflect a world we want to live in. And I want to change this um, for my daughters and for my community. That's why I do what I do. This, by the way, if you want to read more about it, I can share. This is a catalog of bi biases from Cornell University posted um, this um, paper, white paper, if you want to dig into it. But a lot of the different kinds of bias, which is, again, I started this talk with, there's no single definition of fairness. There's, it's even more chaotic when you talk about bias, hence the difficulty. If you Google um, what is bias, and I've dropped a, a slide, uh, the following slide, but if you Google what is bias, the most succinct way th that I could find was this, a shortcut to decision making at a subconscious level. Um, so that's the definition that we're going with today. I did another. I, I talked to a chat bot and it gave me its version. I thought it was funny, but I cut it for time. Because deep learning applications are non-deterministic, we bias the inputs or outputs to get desired results. Hence the fighting bias with bias title of this talk. Uh, for those familiar with neural networks, uh, I don't know how many um, deep learning folks are here. We include randomness um, on purpose, for example, uh, into our models. And, and that's essentially introducing bias, right? Uh, similarly, we apply algorithms during pre-processing while the model is being trained in processing and for our classifications or for our labels, for our, for our predictions, post-processing, uh, to, to get our desired definition of fair. In the same way we measure for performance you know, looking at, you know, uh, you know, accuracy and precision recall, that kind of stuff. Um, and I'll get to that. I, I, I'm, I'm just looking at this crowd and I know who's a practitioner and who's not by, by, by that because I, I can see, I hear a question coming. Uh, but I'll get to that. Um, 
there's no guarantee, again, with deep learning, there's no guarantee that your provided, in, your provided input will provide exactly the same expected output. Uh, we should always, because of that, we should always scrutinize uh, its use to identify the harms to people and have remediations if we decide AI is the best solution. So this is the product manager speaking uh, right now. There are three key stakeholders that I'm gonna, the, this entire talk is gonna be based on. Unfortunately for time, I'm gonna not talk about consumers today, but I will point you to my um, Medium or my Twitter, easier to find, Noble Ackerson, uh, and I'm gonna be uh, continuing this series um, on there. I've already posted a lot of the content of this talk uh, on my Medium already. But we're gonna nerd out with um, how debiasing increases understanding for, for uh, data practitioners, data scientists, ML engineers, ML developers. Uh, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna actually start with policy because I wanna like make you fall asleep and then I'm gonna wake you up with the nerdy stuff because you're probably here for code, right? Um, but before we do that, there's another heavy thing. Uh, so one of these, you've probably heard of um, Dali and um, some of these uh, Dream Studio and Stable Diffusion and all that stuff. Uh, well, I, I took a stab at one of those tools uh, and I typed in first day being released from prison. Um, that guy on the bottom right hand corner looked like Dame Dash from The Rock. All right, we got a lot, of co lot to cover. Um, what kind of bias is this though? Remember from that little virtual saga? Anybody can guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Historical bias. All right, does that make sense? All right, so uh, let me put you to sleep. I promise I only have two slides for this. Policy. Nobody likes talking policy. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I do deal with a lot of attorneys uh, with, in my line of work. We're going to talk about how um, being better stewards of the models that we put out in the production, um, you know, increases trust, um, uh, increases transparency for a regulator, depending on what industry you might be in, say, for example, housing or finance. Um, but I'll just make, I'll pause it here uh, and just say, if I'm a good steward of my user's data, and I have proven ways to explain why a machine learning uh, predicted a thing uh, through some approaches that I'm gonna talk about, you're probably gonna have less scrutiny from the law, from regulators. That's just my this is intuition. And as such, you can innovate more. You can push the boundaries of the technology because you have the governance model, for example. Uh, to make it so. It's good business, I'm just saying. And it keeps the law off your face. Off your... I'll give an example with one of the big uh, tech companies. Uh, I didn't want to make this talk about things that you can just Google, uh, but this is one exception because it's pretty powerful and it talks to the historical traumatized data theme that I'm going with. So a company like Amazon, going with that previous slide, can afford to make mistakes, right? They've got a platoon of attorneys uh, that they can throw at this if they screw up. They also have afforded, like them or hate them, a lot of brand and data trust over the years in protecting yourself. That's why we all use AWS, right? But maybe you don't work for Amazon or your startup might die if you, you, know, if you screw up. Uh, so stop me if you heard this one. Uh, Amazon decides to roll out same day delivery. Um, to US cities. The blue here um, is areas they decided, uh, presumably by an AI, according to their filing, um, to provide coverage. The gray is areas that they decided didn't need coverage. Let's look at Boston for a second. Roxbury, where is Boston? Boston, middle, top, there. Um, well, Township of Roxbury is excluded. You know where this is going? Eerily similar to redlining maps where, you know, folks weren't getting housing, right? 
because they were deemed ha hazardous. Hazardous. We all know what was going on. Uh, and in Amazon's case, again, you got engineers going, they're not racist. No one's calling them racist. But first they get, unfortunately, they got in trouble. And frankly, failure of fairness through unawareness is no excuse. So they get fined. And perhaps Amazon was just predicting the number of purchases, right? Uh, where, which correlates to affluence, right? Uh, which correlates sometimes to race correlation, right? Uh, in the US. Uh, and Amazon did not look at their customers' race at all. Those are called secondary effects. They did not collect black, white, whatever. Like, it was just, are they willing to buy? But how do you explain this to a regulator? Remember, we're in the, the policy section. So let's get into, uh, before we do that, um, I added this because this is perhaps some of the strongest, I follow a lot of legal, I'm a policy nerd, uh, as well as a, you know, and this is the strongest language I've ever seen from an agency. Uh, this is FTC saying if your algorithm results in credit discrimination against a protected class, you can find yourself facing a complaint. Um, basically, they're gonna come knocking. You might be wondering what's a protected class. We'll get into that. So how do you explain it? Uh, how do you explain uh, to a regulator in case you get in trouble? Or how do you basically understand your data and what the black box prediction is? Um, regulators are increasingly requiring model explanations when things go wrong with uh, a learned model, a deployed model. Uh, simple models are inherently interpretable, like a, a um, you know, uh, just by looking at the tree or, or what have you. But as models become more complex, um, you need to start including other models to help explain why a prediction was made, why classification was made, why a recommendation was made, or why a dis an AI is trying to tell you to make this decision. Um, we call that black box models because Deep learning models are all, you know, we just, it just did the thing. And it was like, okay, it's like, that's the prediction. Let's go do it. And then we lose a lot of money. If you remember Zillow, uh, um, they, they, they shut down their house, whatever, whatever they were doing, who knows. Um, so there are different tools, and I'll walk through uh, one of them. Uh, the different tools uh, that we use, practitioners use, to explain a prediction. By explaining a prediction, we mean presenting textual or visual artifacts that provide an understanding of the relationship between your inputs and the model's prediction. So here, you put in an input, uh, you, you scrutinize your labels, uh, and it, you want to know which features are dominant, how the features relate, and frankly, at a global level, why the model predicted what it, it does. Uh, some of the tools, uh, you know, um, this, the tools are sort of fall in a class called explainable models or interpretable, uh, in, interp interpretable AI or XAI. The tools that we use, like Lime is one. There's integrated gradients, especially if you're dealing with a lot of images or unstructured data, uh, like uh, voice or video. Uh, lately, I've been kicking around the tires of an explainability tool called SHAP, comes from Microsoft Research. Um, um, Lum Lumberg et al, that's what I'm gonna say, I remember his last name, I think it's Scott Lumberg. Uh, SHAP stands for Shapely Additive Explanations, and it came again out of Microsoft Research. Pretty cool, it applies game theory uh, to explain the output of any machine learning. And I love game theory, even though I don't understand it, it's over my it's over my head a little bit. So back to that housing example, uh, we're looking at, you've, if you've ever tried machine learning, uh, you've probably gone on Kaggle, and this is like the, the Boston housing um, data set is one of the most popular ones that you see for competitions, where most people like try to predict housing for a specific area. Using SHAP, we're looking further than coefficients of the model uh, that we're using. Um, the training, we're using the training data to give an impact 
of each feature. So this, each one of these things like LSTAT, which stands for lower status of a population, there's number of rooms in an area, you got taxes, you got crime. Over here, by the way, blue arrows reflect the lowest impact on a model's prediction, whereas red, in case, in case you're wondering why the, I don't, I'm not showing what it predicted, uh, but here it predicted something, and lower income status was the most influential thing on that model's prediction, right? And, and LSTAT is basically like, I don't know, it's like adults without a high school education in a specific area, uh, population of like uh, laborers in a specific area, that's how LSTAT is defined. So I'll leave you with this. These are attributes, these attributes on the right, by the way, are those legally, you in the US, legally protected classes. I wanna say there's a lot, this is similar to the EU's if you do business in the EU's. These are some questions that you want, might want to ask. Does my use case or product specifically use a protected class? Like, do I, do I need to include race? I work for agencies like USDA, uh, and we wanted to predict where to send more funds to an er to, uh, in, around the country. In that case, I did need to collect racial data because uh, we wanted to address underserved communities. But you have to ask that question and then work around that. Or if you don't, you say, no, nah, we don't want any trouble, nah, no smoke here. Do we use data that could be correlated, right? Remember the Amazon example uh, with a protected class? And that's a hard question to answer. You just have to work through it with some of the, the uh, procedures that we're gonna, how am I doing on time? All right, I'll speed this along. Uh, could your use case, the big question is number three, could it, negatively impact an individual's economic uh, or other important life opportunities. All right, so we've gone through some of the stuff. If I'm sort of glossing over it or start speeding, this is where you reach me, uh, my first and last name. All right, got another one for you. Which type of uh, biases? This is uh, leading doctors on a panel interviewing a nurse. And this one, um, I didn't come out like I expected. I did different variations of this, but it was almost always the same thing. Uh, I don't see any brown or black people. I, it's kind of hard to tell, uh, but it's also popularity bias or historical bias. So we're gonna go a little deeper. So why bias is important for the second stakeholder uh, or data engineers or data team, the business analyst and your boss maybe, who knows. Um, the choice of fairness metrics uh, and fairness constraints is a crucial step uh, for AI development and deployment, and choosing an unsuitable constraint can lead to more harms. So here you're seeing a typical ML workflow, um, and uh, we introduce a variety to fight bias with bias. We introduce a variety of algorithms to discover and mitigate bias, for example, with typical machine in, within the typical machine learning workflow. So let's walk through this. Um, during EDA or you know, early on in, in, in your exploratory data analysis, which is uh, one of the most crucial, crucial steps in, in getting um, your model out, um, you may want to use like a, a counterfactual, some sort of counterfactual analysis, like what would happen if I introduced this into um, the, uh, into uh, my model's pipeline. And so there are tools, many of them. I like TensorFlow's um, or Google AI's uh, what if tool. Um, that's, you know, that's uh, provides an interface for ex expanding the understanding of uh, black box style classifications uh, and regression ML models. Uh, for bias detection and mitigation though, what al the, the type of algorithm that you choose um, depends on whether you want to fix the data. Uh, so in process, uh, pro sorry, pre-process, uh, you want to fix the classifier in process, or you want to fix the prediction. By pre-process, we mean um, the bias mitigation or the test that we're running 
applies to the data itself. If you can modify the training data, then the preprocessor algorithm, uh, there are many. Uh, some of them are, uh, there's one that I use often called reweighing. Um, uh, a reweighing al algorithm can be used. Reweighing essentially seeks to change the weights applied to your training samples uh, and just sort of spit out, you know, um, a result or an explanation for you. So I dropped the demo portion just to save time. But again, uh, IBM's AIF 360 um, sort of has a list of the algorithms here uh, that you can check out. So let's go, well, that, that's going to stay on the screen. So let's go into end processing. I don't know why this thing cut off, but we'll go with it. Um, in processing, bias mitigation, by in processing, we mean uh, an algorithm to mitigate bias is applied to the model during training uh, on a classifier. So here, if you can modify, if you have the luxury of modifying the learning algorithm, then an end processing algorithm is what you choose. And I, you know, depending on your use case, you might want to use like something called adversarial biasing, or um, there's a few more uh, on that on this link that you might want to look at. Again, depends on your use case. And then the third is post processing, right? You, you spat it out. You have a prediction, uh, and so we test for bias against a predicted label. Uh, basically, here we're just messing with the. Uh, yeah, we're, we're messing with um, uh, the labels uh, to address harms in an unprivileged or underprivileged uh, or protected class. By the way, this is also where you would, you know, use your explainable model to to tell you um, what's going on with either locally by each feature or globally by the prediction. As you normally do, you're monitoring it. I have this opinion that, uh, for those who know the jargon, um, data drift and data skew is a form of bias. Uh, so just include that in your process. Um, so what's at this point in the talk, uh, I spot you know a lot of people start rolling their eyes. Those who do this a day in a day out, because I'm the guy in the room that comes in and tell them to slow down, don't move fast and break things. Um, there has to be a catch when optimizing for bias, performance, and accuracy. It's like a squeeze toy, right? Something's got to give, right? Um, typical machine learning is, the whole objective is to solve an optimization problem. You know, the goal is to minimize error. Um, to, in order to get to fairness, our objective is to solve a constrained optimization problem. Right, um, so that comes with uh, some catches. So rather than say, find a model in my class that minimizes an error, you would say, find the model in my class that minimizes an error, this is a mouthful, such subject to the constraint that none of these seven what are, racial categories or whatever uh, you wanna solve for should have a false negative more than 1%, uh, different than the other ones. Uh, so, it, but if that sounds like a mouthful, it just comes down to this. From what we've learned from our data model, is our model doing good things or bad things <laughs> for people? Um, and is there a likelihood of harm? So that was the hard part earlier. Please go. Yep, unit tests even. Yep. But they don't like to do that. <laughs> data science is like, what is a GitHub? I don't know what to do. It takes more time, right? It's like, but you know, a typical proof of performance project lasts like three months anyway. It's like, so what, just take your time. Don't blow it up for everybody. Uh, I'm gonna tangent here. I know I'm running out of time, but um, in the military, I don't, I'm not in the military at all. I'm actually just naturalized as a US citizen, but uh, they have something called boom events. You know, you know, some catastrophe is gonna happen and left of boom is what they do to prevent harm, um, you know, to plan for the inevitable boom event. Um, the right of boom is like, you know, cleaning it up. I've adapted that when I'm explaining this to people to say like, left of boom for us is, this is gonna be a boom. It's on the internet, it's a model being consumed by a piece of software. Something's gonna happen. Right, it's going to say something racist, <laughs> or you know, unintentionally. Right, you remember Microsoft's uh, pay, whatever. Like that everybody sort of, yeah. So what we do here is to plan for the worst and minimize the impacts. Your your data trust, your brand trust, your money that you're going to spend on lawyers, that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, so 
I'm not sure how many people noticed, and it just cut off the prompt. I hate that. Um, I've been using a lot of AIs to create this um, deck so far, and that was on purpose. This prompt is cut off. I think it was, you know, a face-off between fairness and accuracy, and who wins. And it, I think it's pretty cool. So yeah, uh, because deep learning application again are non-deterministic, the bias. Uh, we bias the inputs and outputs to get the desired results. All right, let's jump right in. By the way, I'm not going to ask the same question because it's the same. It's too repetitive at this point. But I was trying to make a point. Obviously, if you ever wanted to get creative photos of your favorite rap artist, I swear this looks like Talib. This looks like Sway from MTV down there. This is just made up. These are not real people. It's a portrait of a thug. This is cutting edge technology, y'all. You're gonna take this foundational model and put, use it in your own context and do some precog stuff for your local police department. It's, it's, it's terrible. Um, all right, so let me land this plane with uh, some gotchas out in the trenches, the takeaways. One, I've been talking a lot of the social technical issues and it gets deep and uncomfortable sometimes, but I think that's okay. But bias models, I talked about how it's a it just makes business sense. Um, it actually applies to non-protected classes as well. Uh, the, techni the techniques we use to be biased data sets and classifiers can be applied to any group of items, any group of, we talked about people a lot today. It can be applied to any group of things um, or places <coughs> if you're in the geospatial space. Um, for example, Recommender systems, like, you know, if you like this, you might like this pajamas, or, or you should watch this thing um, from Netflix or whatever. Um, they suffer a lot from popularity bias, right? Um, popular items are overly rep recommended at the expense of others. That's one thing. For me, I'm gonna take that a bit, a step further. Social media feeds, right? Popularity bias. Right? So this is not, is not just, you know, how to feel good, altruistic bullshit. No. This is just makes good business sense to consider some of these techniques. Also, I gave you a couple links um, to just to learn. Uh, I sh shared IBM's uh, work. Unfortunately, it's, it's open source and it's not well supported. Um, some of the more mature ones, are, you know, Microsoft's research, uh, Fair Learn does a better job, uh, in my opinion, and also integrates SHAP uh, in there. I believe um, IBM's AIF 360 um, fairness tool that I shared earlier uh, inc inc includes Lime, which their visuals and their graphs kind of suck for me. Um, so I'm going to just consider which one you're gonna use. If you use TensorFlow, you're in good luck, you're in good shape because that's pretty robust and, and mature. Uh, their whole responsible AI toolkit is integrated into your pipeline. That's pretty decent. Because, I'm gonna say this a third time, because deep learning algorithms or deep learning applications of ML are non-deterministic, we bias the inputs or outputs to get the desired results. How you define fairness for one solution will be different from another. So been, it's been about three years and I've, that I've been focused on responsible use of AI. Uh, and three years allows me to define, it's like self-define the work that I'm working on. Uh, there's a Google definition of bias. I'm s asserting that you can fight bias with bias. This is what I mean by that. What was, what is, and what should be. By what was, uh, I mean a lot of the stereotypes um, and historical trauma, right, traumatized data that we've had to deal with over time. What is, is sort of pulling that into your pipeline, your machine learning workflow in order to reduce what was, the impact of what was. And the output of that is what should be, right? a world that we all want to live in as best as we can. Because as, I, as you've learned today, one key takeaway is that it's not easy. And it's always not going to be fair. But we want to strive for 
what should be. And that is my talk. Questions, if we have time. We are over time, but please, hit me. <laughs> What are some ways that, that you are um, kind of maintaining this integrity with data? You and I were talking beforehand about the GPT-3, and I was working on a, a chat bot, and we were having a conversation of inputs and outputs. So, so what are some ways that, that you sanitize either your inputs or outputs to help mitigate what comes through? If you have control of the data, um, you can run a pre-processing algorithm on that data in order to sort of give you uh, some ideas. If the data looks good, but you want to understand counterfactually what could happen as the data grows, uh, counterfactual tools are available. I talked about um, the what if tool. There's a company out there called CausaLens they're the only company I know that is working on causal graphs, like, you know, because all machine learning is just correlations, right? Um, and so you may not get everything that you, all the answers that you want just by running what if. Uh, so you sometimes want to learn, all right, I have this counterfactual. What was the, what would be the cause of that problem? So if you have control of the data, the raw data, in your case, I think you did. Um, that's where you, you'd run your tests against. Some people don't have that luxury with the rise of transformers and base models, foundational models, that kind of stuff. So there, and if you have control over the, um, uh, the training process, which you probably do, um, well, you can't train, you can't touch the foundational model, you can, you can add to it. Uh, a preprocessor, probably more likely a post-processing algorithm. And then, ex you know, use explainability metrics or along those lines. Should I, I feel like I bummed everyone out. <laughs> yes, please. So, um, we, we, we did talk a lot about bias and fairness, and um, there's a lot of work and effort that goes into trying to, to make sure that you're our, our models is, are as unbiased and fair as possible. But do you think there ever, there should ever get to a point where you should just say no? Like, we're, we put a lot of effort into this and we're still saying bias, we're still saying X, Y, and Z. Maybe we just shouldn't do that. There's a problem with that. I, I, I'm like, I normally introduce this talk by sharing my biases and my assumptions, uh, which is kind of meta, and I talk about that. But you can't stop the pace of innovation. Like, it's gonna happen. Today, the, 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 the bell of the ball is transformer models, and it's just the way everything is happening. People feel that that's our path to artificial general intelligence and all that stuff and how scary that is in your context of your question. But I guarantee in two years, we'd be talking about, remember when we used transformer models? Remember when everybody was creating images from text? Um, so you can't stop the pace of innovation. Uh, succinctly, I'd say bridging research ML with, sort of from academia, with practical ML. The problem is a lot of, Enterprising practitioners are sort of just lifting research and just applying it to production in a way to solve a specific problem, and, and it's okay. But it comes at a cost of potential harm uh, without all the checks and lots of like slow down and, and make sure this is right. Um, I see that a lot with you know DeFi and NFTs. Not to say nothing is wrong with it. It's like we're taking a lot of research as raw and applying it to things that could affect someone's life. And so just slowing down and at least building upon some of these techniques will make us better, but you know, it's, it's a, we, you can't stop innovation. Yeah, and, and to, to clarify like that, that wasn't a question that just, you know, across the industry. It's 
Oh, okay. In specific scenarios. Yeah. Right? Like, recommendation engines, cool, let's do that. That's not terribly harmful to anybody if you know. You recommend the wrong thing for me to buy my Amazon, right? Like, I don't care about this, I'm just going to keep scrolling. But in the case of, like, you know, what like the police are doing to try to identify, yep. like, high crime areas and so, like, try to do spatial, facial I see. Yeah, yeah. stuff like that, right? Like, do we get to a point where it's like, okay, maybe this probably isn't. The good news is you're on point. So there's a part of this talk, a longer version of this, it's like a workshop where we talk about the balance of regulations, innovation, and what users need, right? There's a tension there. So the good news is today you can't go to court. A judge will be disbarred or a lawyer will be disbarred if they used a lie detector test to uh, create a judgment whether you get go to jail or uh, you're to be released from jail, right? Because you because it's not perfect science, and so regulation played a role there, right? Um, today, in many states, you can't use facial recognition, right? They, you know, government saw the harm and said, "Yeah, let's pull the brakes on this for a little bit." Google uh, notably said, "Yeah, we have." all these tools to create these crazy things, I probably should wrap up here. We have all these tools to create all these facial recognition type things, but that could lead to harm. So actually in their Vertex AI platform, you cannot train based on images that you've gathered, right? It's blocked. You can do that, they gave an ex exception, you can do that on celebrities or public figures, right? So there's a constraint there. So that's the tension between the rise of data, the rise in breaches or harms, and of course, regula regulatory action, that's sort of that tension. Thank you.